Hello, hello. Hi, Sam. How are you doing? Can you hear me? Oh, wait. I can hear you. Yep. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome. How are you doing? Good. Well, thank, I'm glad you made it because I was looking at the people who are attending. A lot of them you already know. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I appreciate you putting this together. Oh, I, I got quite a there. lot of people. I think uh, maybe we have like 30 on this call. <laughs> that would be awesome. Hi, Sano. How are you? Hi, Grace. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Good to see you. Is it still cold in Salt Lake City? It was so nice today. It was nice and sunny and like 60 degrees. It was so warm. Nice, nice. Yeah, it was really nice. Hi, Sam. Hi, Grace. You know, well, Ellen? Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Sam. We met a few years ago, I think, in Las Vegas. Absolutely. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing awesome. Doing good. Thank you for the invitation. I'm excited to hear. Oh, you. I'm so glad you can join. <laughs> I don't know. Like I talked to so many people about investment. I can't remember. I said, okay, tell me. We'll record it. I think he's recording, which is great. Yep. Some of I'm recording. my uh, friends can't make it. So, so let's see. Uh, Miro, hi. How are you doing? I think you guys have spoken too before. I think so. Yeah. A lot of people jumping in right now. Lots of people. So let's see. You should know Terry, Terry and Peter. Hi. Peter's joining pretty soon. They, they uh, bought a fourplex. Yeah, I remember. Absolutely. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Sam? I am awesome. And let's see. Sono is uh, her well, and her Peter, husband. Peter Newton. Well, they are my clients, and we become good friends. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> yeah, Peter. Peter's joining separately from. Yep. He just jumped in, or he's joining okay. as we speak. <clears throat> so for those of you guys that don't know Jeremy, he's my partner and my business coach. <laughs> then became my partner. Um, and then Jeremy, just so you know, this group, um, is everyone in the Bay Area, Grace? Is there anybody not in the Bay Area? Hmm. Miro is in the wine country. Are you still up there? Yeah. So it's still Bay Area, kind of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Grace Sang is my good friend. Uh, she's there in the Bay Area. And we've been, let's see, we've known each other since when, Grace? How long ago was uh, that? A long time. Long time. Well, so I've been in the business training. for 10, maybe eight. Yeah, I think we've known each other about eight years. So we met each other at Mike Ferry trainings and we started talking investing. And you know, I was impressed with all the research and you going out to the Midwest and and we just took it from there, bought some fourplexes <laughs> and, and Idaho and Utah together. And and now you've done really well. Oh, I have some good news for you, Grace, on the townhomes. Okay. Um, so they're selling for 540 now, the new ones. And you yeah. bought for what, 275 or no, 310, I think. 310. I 310. Yeah. Well, that's not bad. And in a few years, 200,000 a piece and equity gain and yep. and rents going up as well. So yeah. Yep. Anyways, I'm I'm glad uh that's going well. But yeah, Grace and I have known each other for quite a while and it's been fun. I've come out to the Bay Area to talk <clears throat> talk investments. And now you're in a few of our oh, Steve and Mac just joined. Um, now you're in a few of our multifamily properties in Cleveland, El Paso, Florida. And um, are you in the Dallas one? I can't remember. I don't think so. No, I don't think oh, so. You, just, you, uh, you had that 1030, it was a couple 1031s you did El Paso and um, yeah. and, so. uh, and Florida and Cleveland. So Stephen Mack, welcome. It's been a while. Hey, it's a long time. <laughs> How, How are you good? doing? <laughs> Easy, yeah. <laughs> yep. Very good. You're doing good. Oh. Yeah, doing great, right? Yeah. Yeah. Got Grace on. Let me go to speaker view. So, I 
think we're about ready to go. Um, I've got the OMs pulled up. Grace, which one should we start with? El Paso or uh, San Antonio? I was or... looking at both. The one in San Antonio looks amazing. Oh my gosh. It's, it's so cool. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I've got a little backstory. I'll tell people on that one. I'm going to go to my Facebook though, because I have a cool walkthrough I did of a unit. So I want to tell you like a lot of, um, uh, a lot of my clients, friends, uh, some of them may not, I'm not familiar with uh, syndication. Mm -hmm. So I, I told them, you know, I used to buy residential homes until, you know, especially during the pandemic, they have gone through the roof, then your return actually is uh, not as good. Plus, you have more risk because you hold one property. If your tenants leave or don't pay rent, then like you don't get any income, right? So then in the last couple of years, it's more of the value is in the bigger project. And Sam in his and his group actually would only buy stuff at value like Warren Buffett. So which, you know, you, you have more tenants to spread the risk and they're usually in areas that are, don't have a lot of, uh, you know, rent or rental or tenant protection which right. is good for the landlord so it's also you know a lot of things that I learned from them and that's why I have been during the pandemic I've done I don't think I've purchased any property during the pandemic for investment purposes right. it's, it's only for um, you just put money in, in a few of our deals yeah yeah so if you kind of maybe give some background on syndication that would help as well yeah well hey that was a great intro thanks grace um and everyone if you don't mind muting yourself just make sure you're mute i'll i'll mute a few that i see so there's less uh, background noise oops um i accidentally asked one of you to unmute just stay muted um so we'll all get started and um grace thank you for putting this together and yeah i've, I've been um geez selling investment properties and buying investment properties here in utah since 2010 bought my first flip and then i bought a duplex and then i started selling duplexes and it's my passion it's what i love to do and it's been a lot of fun and it slowly grew it grew into selling a lot of duplexes to investors and clients and and i would watch what happened and what they did well what, what didn't go well and i mean pretty much everything's gone well since 2010 but you know there's mistakes that that i learned from that investors would make and then i got with a group and we started building fourplex communities we built uh, a couple hundred few hundred million dollars worth of fourplex communities all over utah idaho and texas and those did great and and i kept coming back to um, a thought and and when i got in real estate the market was rough and my thought was what if 2008 happens again? Because when I started selling real estate, half of the people I would talk to were underwater that didn't lose their house. I mean, the people that didn't lose their home or their investment property were underwater and, and they were struggling. Um, the resounding answer as I did my research was the people who bought larger multifamily and bought for cash flow, not appreciation, did just fine. So they didn't sweat it. They did just fine during the Great Recession. They cash flowed. And in fact, in many cases, when you had a good multifamily property, rents went up because people were losing their homes and needed a place to live still. So while the residential market was abysmal and bottoming out, the multifamily market uh, was doing actually pretty well and, and it continued to do well. So um, as I was selling more and more and more properties to my investors, I started feeling uneasy and worried about their well-being, their, their portfolio, growing it the wrong way. And um, the market got hotter, prices got higher, cap rates got lower, cash flow went down. And I started just looking at what would happen if 2008 happened again. And, and a lot of my investors, I felt, were, weren't being as smart as they could be as, as far as purchasing for cash flow, having backup plans, um, and... Uh, and it just made me a little bit nervous. And so I had this very loyal following of people like Grace and, and many of you who have purchased with me. And I said, you know, how can I help them, A, invest safer and with less, ri less risk, B, make more money if possible, and C, take um, some of the mistakes off their hands that they're making as far as management goes. How can I kind of control that better for them? and sleep better at night myself, knowing I've, I've put these investors into properties that 
are lower risk and higher returning and, and just better all around. So that's what, how I got to the answer of syndication, uh, large multifamily. And I started doing a lot of research and realized that that's exactly what happened in 2008. The large multifamily investors did very well. And then they became very wealthy um, buying everyone else's properties since they had the cash flow to do so during the recession. And that became my goal for myself and for my investors. So in 2018, we started buying large multifamily. I stopped selling real estate full time. I still sell a little bit here in Utah um, just for fun. But uh, I stopped selling full time. And, and since then, we've bought, well, with, with Timber Hills, with this closing that we're about to have, in um, San Antonio, and then the one in um, Cleveland will have about $170 million worth of multifamily under management. And thanks to people like you who've invested with us, Grace, and, and everyone else that have invested with us. And the scalability has been amazing. And that's where the risk mitigation comes from is the scale. So this property we're going to talk about today is, is 340 doors. And we will never buy a property that can't pay its pay for itself with some large vacancy. So if you own a single family house and the renter moves out, you're in trouble. You're paying that mortgage. And if you have a duplex and one of the renters moves out, you're probably covering a lot of the expenses. Some of your expenses will be covered, but you're still covering a lot. So as you go bigger and you have a few renters move out, it affects you less. And that's always been the goal. So um, these properties we buy, we, we won't buy them unless they can have 20% vacancy and still cover their own expenses. Because we know from the research of 2008, 9, 10, 11, that in some cases, vacancy went up to 10, 15%. And, and people struggled, but the people who bought for cash flow, who had scale, did just fine. So that's our goal is, is to even through a 2008 type recession, even with 15, 20% vacancy, we can still at least break even and not have any issues. And many of the properties we've bought in the last three years could be 30% vacant and still cover the bills. One of them was 44%. It could be 44% vacant and mortgage expenses, everything is still covered. And you know that's what a, a really good smart investor, someone who's sophisticated and understands the numbers, that's, that's what makes them sleep good at night is knowing, hey, I can have some pretty huge vacancy or something really bad can happen and I'll be just fine. So that's where we're at. And uh, we're having a ton of fun. Um, we've been blessed with a very good market and the appreciation you guys have all seen in your markets has happened on the properties that Grace has invested in. So Grace, we're going to have one of our best months in El Paso this month, even in the middle of a management change and um, struggling with, we have 24 vacancies. We actually hit our, our income goal for the month, even with 24 vacancies, which speaks to a good manager and collections. And so with 24 vacancies on 160 unit property, we're doing fine and still paying out some great cash flow. The next few months are going to be even better as we fill those vacancies. And they're vacant on purpose because we're remodeling the units and, and we need to get those remodeled. That's part of the business plan. But as those remodels finish, the cash flow is going to be even better than we expected. Um, so that's exciting on El Paso. Uh, Dallas, we're going to have our biggest month ever in that property. So that's 127 doors in Dallas. Um, by far our biggest month for rent collections and rents keep going up and it's looking gorgeous. So our goal is to find a property that's maybe outdated or for some reason rents are low. It's in a good location, great market with jobs, with landlord friendly laws, with growth. And um, we want to see how we can improve the property or improve the management of the property to increase the income. So that's what value add means. So I'm going to share my screen and the value add play on this deal in San Antonio is not a remodel. Hold on one sec, guys. Sorry. My furnace kicked on and I was cooking. Um, so the... The Timber Hill Commons is a management play. It was built two years ago, and I'm really excited about it. I told my team about four months ago, I said, guys, we've got to find one of these newer properties that the builder hurried and leased up so that he could refinance out his money. And that's very, very common. I've seen it happen over and over again, 
we've just always been outbid by other buyers. And so these builders will build a property. They've got all their money in this property and it has to be 90% occupied for 90 days in order, in order for them to refinance out of the construction loan and get a long-term loan. So as soon as, I mean, they're getting close to being finished, the pressure is on and I've been waiting for this type of opportunity. So currently rents are $250 a month low on this property because two years ago when it finished, they were in a rush to get 340 units filled and they did it fast. It's a gorgeous property. They didn't really have any issues, but they did do it low so they could fill it fast and, and refi their money out. Now we have the opportunity to put in a better management team who uh, understands the market. Uh, the other properties they have in the area are rented in full through June or July. So they really know what they're doing. And that's the value play for us is we're not fixing anything. We're not repairing anything. It's a gorgeous, beautiful property. Um, and you guys can see my screen, right? The T Timber Hill Common screen. It's a gorgeous property, class A, two years old in a great market near San, in San Antonio. And it has scale, 340 units, um, absolutely beautiful. And um, it's close to jobs and, and healthcare. And actually one beautiful thing about the San Antonio market, I think it's fifth or maybe sixth in the country as when it comes to healthcare as a ratio of total employment, which we love. You know, Cleveland, we're, we're up there near the Cleveland Clinic, number two hospital in the world. And we love healthcare jobs and, and the renter demographic that that brings. So this is much like most of our investments, three to five year hold, $100,000 minimum investment, uh, an 8% preferred return, um, target internal rate of return, 16 to 18%. And um, we had an anticipated, anticipated closing date of this week. We extended because we had an investor or a few investors not able to get their funds in on time. So we're closing this, the 7th of April now. Um, but it's a beautifully laid out property, gorgeous amenities, $250 plus low in rents. And um, that's called loss to lease. So when you lease up a property and you've left money on, a ta on the table because the lease is low, that's called loss to lease. We're buying it for 68 million and um, I'm excited. So I'm not going to go through all the numbers. You guys should have all this link. If you don't, let us know. We'll send you this, this pitch deck. What's the structure and status and, and how does it all work? Uh, yeah, I, I can, but let's see. I think it's like Sam's back. Oh, Sam, okay. No, that's okay. I just Am want to back. Yeah, you're right. We fill in the, the, the dead air while Sam was working on that. <laughs> yeah, we were I'm just gonna, filling dead air, Sam. I'm calling my, my mom, my babysitter, to tell her to turn off. the. Can you turn off the movie, the kid's movie? I think it's on my internet. Okay. Uh, kids, tell the kids, okay? Okay, kids, turn off the movie, please. <laughs> Go play. Go take a bath. <laughs> Grace, you're on mute. You're, yeah, you're on mute, Grace. Sorry. I said, like, this project is very unique because I you always see them buy stuff that is value add. And you see Sam on Facebook, like, remodeling that pink bathroom. With ooh, all pink ooh let's show that. <laughs> And then like, this is actually gorgeous. Everything is brand new, which they normally, they not in that market. I know that one. Let's see, um, where's, where's because you don't bathroom? want a class A that, you know, may potentially if the market turns, then people don't want to, you know, with that kind of high rent, but because they started with low rent anyway. So there is some potential there uh, for increased in uh, revenue. Here we go. Here's the pink bathroom. I know, I bathroom. And you're so tall. That bathroom is so small. <laughs> yeah, it's, it wasn't big. That's <laughs> typically what we do. We take, take it from this, make it look like that. And renters love us. They usually just switch. They'll be living in one that we're close to where we're remodeling. And let's move down, down the hallway to a remodeled one. They love it. Because these, I mean, I don't know what year, what year do you guys think that pink is from? I'm guessing 60s, 70s. 65. That's 65? My, my vote. My guess was going to be 68 because that's about that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have, yeah, I have no idea, but I mean, it's old. Um, let me pull up. So, so Grace, sorry, go ahead and continue. Um, oh, no, I, I was just really saying like this, this one is very interesting. But and then you have you talking about some investors couldn't get their funds together. That's why you still not fully closed. Right. On this. Yeah. One. So we had a guy that was putting in three million and. Um, 
couldn't get his property sold in time. So, I mean, that's a big chunk of money. So luckily we opened it back up and um, people like you guys have an opportunity. We're about full again on the 3 million. I think we're about done. There may be a couple spots left. We're starting the Cleveland raise, which we'll talk about that one. Um, you just saw the pink bathroom from its sister property. Um, but as you can see, this isn't a value add property. There's nothing we need to do to make this look better. Um, although the, um, the rain, the drain, what do you call those? The cement blocks where the rain gutters drain onto, they were installed backwards, which I thought was hilarious. Um, there's really nothing to be done at the property though. It's, it's gorgeous, just better management. And so my good friend, Ferris Musa, and then his partner, Ben Suttles, they have a few thousand doors in Texas. They're out of Houston. They're going to manage this for us. And, um, they have a lot of properties in San Antonio and they're the ones that have other properties in the same market, just down the street, already leased out through June and July. Um, so that's the upside. That's the quote unquote value add play on, on this property mm -hmm. is um, just better management, tightening up the numbers. And, um, you know, a good example of that, Grace, is, is also Dallas. Um, we fired our property manager and, and nothing really changed in, in the last few months other than better management. And we went from collecting, you know, 125,000 a month. This month we're at $140,000 collected. Mm -hmm. Same renters, same property. I mean, we, we striped the parking lot and we painted it, but you know, that doesn't increase rent collection. So um, there, there's a lot that can be done with a good asset management team, which is what my company does and a good property management team, which is the, the people that we oversee. Okay, so I asked this question before. So for projects that you have to do rehab, so it, you may the investors may or may not get a return right away. So sometimes Correct. it takes a couple of months to stabilize uh, the operation that the remodel go on, like, you know, carry on. Exactly. So with this, you would get like an immediate return sooner? Or yeah, so like this one, it's going to be, and, and there's an example right here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but year one, um, as we get rid of the tenants that are, or not get rid of, but allow them to decide to stay or pay higher rent. Um, first year, we're estimating about 5% cash flow on the San Antonio property. Um, that'll start three months after we purchase. So May, June, July is when that would start. 7% um, year two and 10, 10% plus after that. So amazing opportunity. Like I said, I've been pushing my team to look for properties like this. And we got really lucky to, um, line this one up. So I'm excited. And um, the Cleveland property is, is very different. There's more upside. Sam, before we move on, what's that? Uh, before we move on, I got a question. Um, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with this indication, but you, it indicates that there's a five-year target. So the plan is after five years showing a better cash flow, you would then sell the, the property. Is that correct? Yeah, we, we try to, um, our, our goal is to double your money every five years and then redeploy it. We never want to hold on to your money very long if we don't have to, because it's just sitting there. If, if, if you've earned, you know, you put in a hundred thousand, you've earned another hundred thousand in equity. We either want to refinance out that money and hold on to the property, or if we can't refinance enough of it out of the property through a cash out refi, then we need to sell it so you can redeploy because then you can leverage more of the bank's money on another great value add property, have, have more tax deductions and returns on, on that money that you've earned. And so that's why it's called the law of diminishing returns. It's, it's really unwise and, and the smart, sophisticated investors never hold on to properties long-term unless they can ca uh, cash out refi their, their money. Okay, I was just wondering, wondering what the model is for this one. Okay. Yeah, yeah five, five years. is, And, um, you know, at Dallas, we've already almost doubled our investors' money, and, and it's been less than two years. So as soon as we can, we're going to either refi or sell. As um, soon as we can double your money, we're going to try and refi and, and, or sell. Um, I would love to never sell a property ever. I mean, ideally, um, I know this guy that has 6,000 doors in, in Philadelphia, and he's had them since the 80s. And he's on like his seventh cash out refi on some of them. You know, he just keeps pulling out money and getting a new loan and holding on to it, doing the repairs and updates himself, and then taking that money out and, and buying more units. So that's the ideal model that, that we have. Um, it's not always possible, but that's ideal. So Sam, this is Terry. So how do you know, I mean, if, even if that's the plan, right, for five years, 
at what point do you communicate that the plans have changed or that something is, you know, that it's not going to whatever the expectation is that's been set? Yeah, I have a weekly update every Friday. You guys are all welcome to join. I um, Grace, you can, if anybody lets you know they want to join that. So I just do a weekly update and um, we talk about it every week. We let you guys know what's going on. And right now we're getting unsolicited offers on all of our properties. And some of them are at numbers that are just ridiculous. And so we're trying to decide, do we take our money and run? But then the problem is we, we want to go redeploy that capital. So we have to find a good deal and, and to be able to do that and, and do it well. But we also have prepayment penalties in a lot of these properties. Um, so we're doing running the math and just trying to figure that out. But Every Friday, I do a call just like this. Usually, it's at 1 o'clock Mountain Time. Tomorrow, it's at 10 o'clock Mountain Time, 10 a.m. And we just let our investors ask questions just like you just asked. And we're very um, just open. You know, We're not just trying to, to not have you guys ask questions. We love educating people and letting you know what's going on. So for the structure of this, would we, would we be investing in this particular property or would uh -huh. we be investing in the asset management company that happens to own the property? Great question. So that's the difference between a fund and a syndication. A syndication is deal by deal. You invest in that specific property. A fund, if, if I were raising a fund, like let's say I, I decide to raise a $50 million fund, um, then I would say, okay, guys, I'm pitching you this type of a property. You trust me. You've invested your money with me and my fund, and I'm going to go buy whatever property I want to buy and I just have to give you a return. And that's great as well. There's, and, and that's the ultimate goal is, is to have a fund. We just had a, a fund invest with us that, or commit to invest with us. I'm signing the paperwork tonight. They have 500 million to invest. They've, they've committed 100 million to us to place on a deal by deal basis in, in, in our property. So there's so many ways to, to skin the cat, uh, you, you could say, um, but the way we do it for now because deal flow in a hot market is tough, I don't want to be committed to a fund and I'd rather just do it. We don't have any problems raising money. So I'd rather just do it deal by deal basis at this point. And you like San Antonio, you invest in San Antonio. You like the Cleveland property more because you like medical and, and you love the Cleveland clinic and you, maybe you invest in that one or maybe you do both. So either way it'd be, uh, we would become part equity owners in this property. Yeah, you're called what's uh, you're what's called a limited investor. So you have no legal liability, financial liability, um, also no decision making ability. So all of that lands on me. I sign my name on the loan with my partners. Um, someone slips and falls, I have that liability. Someone sues me or sues the property or any financial issues from contractors. All of that lands on me, and I'm what's called a general partner, and um, have that decision making ability for the property. And then in a syndication, the limited partners are those that just invest, invest capital, and that's the extent of their investment and their exposure. Okay, thanks for answering my questions. Yeah, no problem. Any more? Anything else? Well, probably more as we go along. Cool. <laughs> I think you should do a tour every year and let all the investors come see the property. Heck yeah. Yeah, I mean, you guys are, are invited any time I go. So <laughs> we'll be out to Cleveland next month and... <clears throat> actually a number of you guys i mean ed kaminsky's come out michael young's come out uh valerie's friend i can't remember his name geez brian came out um we've had um mike and capri darda so we've had a ton of people out to visit these properties you're welcome to come anytime we're we're there and e even actually we just had um michael young's friend leslie there from the bay area she flew to cleveland her daughter's actually going to case western or yeah, going to Case Western and stays right down the street from our unit. So she went and popped in and, and Jason took her through a tour. So we're, we're happy to arrange that, of course. Okay, so I'm going to keep moving since we uh, don't want to take all night. Um, love the property, love the location, love the team. So I have a little bromance going on with Steve Breton and his partners. We met through a mastermind group three years ago, and he's just one of the most conservative, uh, very cautious guys and, you know, I started a podcast called Recession Proof Real Estate Investing. My goal was to learn from the mistakes of, that people made in 2008 and leading up to 2008. And so Steve, I had Steve on the podcast. We really connected. And there's a lot of deals that people buy all the time that I feel are way too high risk and don't have a good exit plan. 
and couldn't withstand the 2008 type recession. So when he and I talked about that, we said, man, we got to do a deal together someday. So he actually came in and, and um, finally we were able to line up our, our timelines and, and money raises and, and joined forces on the El Paso deal, the $27 million property we closed on in November 1st of last year. And so this is our second property together. Uh, Vahano is is same way. He's a CPA, knows the numbers, and um, is doing a great job. He's vertically integrating his company right now, owning the property management and painting and, and contractor side as well. So um, that's what you invest in when you invest in a syndication or a fund. The property is important. It's important to know the numbers and know if it's conservative enough to withstand a, a recession, if it's going to cash flow. Um, but you also need to know who's making decisions and who's watching over the property. We've had some serious dishonesty and issues with uh, property managers at one of our properties, um, El Paso Grace, uh, the one that you're in. And I had to fire the property management company and, and clean that up. Pers I've been flying out there personally. We have a new property manager in there that's now doing leaps and, and bounds better. They're, they're getting five-star Google reviews and it, it's all better now. But if, if you don't have a team that's on the ball and catches those things, that could have cost our investors a ton of money. And um, you want to know when you're investing that you've got the right group who's on the ball, but also conservative enough not to pull you into deals that you shouldn't be buying. Um, we're looking at a deal right now in Georgia that a guy who Steve and I know, he's, he's not very cautious, um, likes to buy a lot of properties and just hope they do well. Um, we're looking at buying one from the bank that, that he's losing to the bank. And to lose a, a property to the bank in this market is, is sad. It's really hard to lose in this market, but he's losing and he's losing all of his investors' money. So um, to be very clear, um, there's two aspects of risk on these deals. One is the team that you're investing with. Number two is the property. Most people only focus on the property and forget about the team. So there you go. Um, any questions on that? So when we, uh, this is Steven, yeah. So when we invest like in the real estate, like we can using depreciation, whatever ways like to reduce the tax, yeah, for the income. So when investing in, invest in the syndications, yeah, what's the tax consequence? Is it considered like income tax or capital gain? How does it work, yeah? Steven, thank you. Really good question. Um, it's like the best part about multifamily is the co the tax savings are way bigger than you know, you have some fourplexes, so duplexes, fourplexes, any single family um, properties you could own, they're about five to seven times bigger. And the reason is, is there's, you know, in this property you're looking at right now, um, 75 water heaters, 75 dishwashers, um, we can, the IRS allows us to expense all of that in the first few years, instead of depreciating the asset over 27 and a half years, um, the IRS just they want people to buy multifamily and they said how can we help incentivize investors to uh, remodel and take care of multifamily well that's through this rule which is called um, cost segregation and 100% bonus depreciation in the in the first year so we do that and so on the last Cleveland property we purchased if you invested a hundred thousand dollars with us you were getting about 60 to 70 thousand back the first year as a tax loss or a tax write-off through depreciation. And um, it's just proportional to, based on how much of uh, the property you own or how much you've invested. So it's a beautiful thing. We have a lot of investors who make money in the stock market, have other investments. Half the reason they're investing is just to get these amazing tax write-offs that, that we get. Stephen, any follow-up questions to that? Thank you, yeah. So that I can sell my stock to invest you on syndication. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, for example, I sold my hotel in um, 2020. We tripled our money on that property. And then I sold two other properties, the townhomes that, that Grace has here in League High in the Silicon Slopes. She has the same ones. Um, let's see. Sam. Oh, oh. Sam, but, Sam. Hey, Sam. How's it going? Um, so, and I didn't do a 1031. I sold my hotel and my other two properties. I did not do a 1031 and actually invested in all of the properties we bought that year. And I had enough tax losses to offset my capital gains. Now I'm not a CPA. So you want to work that with, out with your CPA. I'm happy to jump on with a CPA and help walk them through that. And, and we've done that for a number of people who will sell properties, decide that, you know what, capital gains are probably going up. This 
current administration and every administration after this probably isn't going to lower capital gains taxes because no one ever does. Um, whether you're Republican or Democrat, that's just something I think most people, most parties have agreed on is that taxes, those taxes go up. So my, my thought process was, well, you know, I might as well use these write-offs, eliminate my capital gains now while they're lower than they will be and uh, reset my basis. And so that's what I did in, in 2020. And um, a number of our investors have done that as well. So we can work with 1031 exchanges. We just accepted one today for the next Cleveland property. Um, it has to work out. There's lots of contingencies there. But anyways, we can talk about taxes uh, all night long. I'm going to get on to this deal. Um, Sam? Any follow-up questions to that, Stephen? Sam? That's a Peter. Uh, Peter, that has Peter? A hey, Peter. Peter Wayne has a question. Hey, Sam. Yeah, I have a follow-up to that. Um, I believe that as uh, passive investors, we do not get to um, depreciate on an annual basis. Is that correct? Uh, you do get the, the depreciation. Yeah, we just sent out about 100 K-1s with some really great depreciation for our investors. So that in a REIT, you do not. I know in a REIT, you absolutely do not get any get to participate in the uh, depreciation. In the syndication, you actually own a portion of the LLC that owns the property and you do get to participate. Oh, so there's no difference between an active and a passive investor? I, I thought that there, there was. There is, and, and there's a lot of uh, regulations. I'm actually not supposed to take depreciation on the property unless you guys have received 100% of your uh, investment in depreciation back. So yeah, there's, there's a bunch of regulations. I'm happy to talk about it with you off this offline on a, cool, on a private call because okay. there's yeah. so many <laughs> yeah, regulations and I'm not a CPA, but I do understand, I think most of it. So um, in going back to Cleveland, um, Jason Perro is my partner there. He had a thousand doors there before he partnered with us. He's been doing it, um, been doing well there for a long time. Um, it's a great city, you know, um, it's in the Rust Belt, but the economy has been stable and, and the population has been stable since the 1960s. It hasn't really changed. And, you know, if we can't have massive growth, we love stability. And it has the number two hospital in the world. So if you look at Cleveland um, and if you ever visit, don't go to East Cleveland, you'll get shot. Um, I did drive through and, and I quickly drove out of East Cleveland. Um, if you go just a few miles south, you get to Cleveland Heights and, and the Cleveland Clinic. And this is a gorgeous, beautiful, fun neighborhood, fun part of town. Um, and you have over, geez, uh, just uh, the university hospitals is over 20,000 um, nurses and, and workers. Then you have, Case, you have Case Western, you have the Cleveland Clinic itself, number two hospital in the world, the main campus right here. Um, you have a, a dental school and um, just an amazing area. So what we own is a portfolio of almost 500 doors. It'll be over 500 in the next month, all right here, all within walking distance of University Hospitals and Cleveland Clinic. And so the renter demographic is phenomenal. Our average credit score is 745. Our average income is 80,000, whereas the Cleveland, Cleveland's average income is in the 40s. So we're almost double the average income. And that's just a really good renter demographic. And here's my favorite part, and you guys can laugh at this, but they're never there. They're never in their units. The, the nurses and the doctors and the surgeons and the med students, they're all on campus. And so it's like they don't even live there. It's, it's comical. We'll, we'll go into these units. And it's like they have a bed and like no food in the fridge. And um, it's, it's a beautiful thing. So we love this portfolio, but um, we own a bunch of these buildings right here, a bunch of these buildings right here, um, a bunch here, going up Kenilworth. And, you know, these are all built, built in the 1950s, thereabouts. And um, it's a walkable, beautiful neighborhood with doctors and groceries. And it's just a, it's a great submarket of Cleveland. So we love this Cleveland Clinic area. If, you, if we zoom out, the number one um, and safest neighborhood and best neighborhood in the Cleveland area is Lakewood. You know, you have the uh, sports stars and, and people with money live in Lakewood. So the two best areas would be the Cleveland Heights, Shaker Heights area, and then Lakewood. So this purchase that we're closing on here in the next 30 days is here in Lakewood. And you're just minutes from downtown. 
Um, huge gentrification going on downtown, a lot of med tech and biotech. Um, you know, COVID really pushed and, and helped a lot of companies um, grow in the medical field. And Cleveland has seen a lot of that because of their, their Cleveland Clinic ties. You have another Cleveland Clinic um, campus over here. So we love Lakewood. Um, it's a great market. That's what we're talking about right here. We have 75 units, kind of small for us, but the upside is there and we could, we just couldn't pass it up. So we're trying not to buy anything under 150 doors, but um, yeah, we just couldn't pass it up. It's they're they're awesome units and, um, and uh, they haven't been remodeled since maybe the sixties, who knows? I mean, you guys saw that pink bathroom, there, there's been renovation and, and a lot of repairs, um, but uh that a lot of the units are, are pretty basic and, and pretty original. And so we've got neighbors that have started remodeling and where our average rents are 700, their average rents that they're getting for remodeled units are 1400 and up. Um, so we're doing a 7% preferred return, um, average annual return of 20%. So a little bit better than San Antonio by three or 4%. And we're only raising two and a half million and half of that's already spoken for by Rand, our, our buddy out of Florida that um, has quite a bit to invest. Um, oh, and and we're spending just over 1.35 million on the remodel, um, 50,000 minimum investment. Let's see, let me go down this way. So Jason Perro and his wife, Nadia, they're the Cleveland rock stars. Um, they already had a thousand doors. Now they have almost, I think 1700 in the area, including the ones they own with us. Jens is on all the Cleveland deals. We are. Calvin's my my intern. Um, if you guys get calls from him, now you know why, because he's he's working for us. Then most of you know Lyndon, Tien, my acquisitions and operations guys, and, and then I'm leading the leading the charge there. Um all really, really good people, by the way. Um, I think we're we're very picky with our partners and Jason and his partner Jens and his wife. And then Steve, who you guys saw in the last deal, are probably two of the only people I, I would want to work with on multifamily deals because we get along so well, but also because I know they're honest and um, they make right decisions. So um, some of the properties are built in 1912. I mean, they're old, <laughs> very, very old portfolio, um, but have been updated and we're going to update them even more. And um, the upside is there. So I'm not going to go through a lot of this. You guys will have all this to go through later. Um, let me skip down. So the your first property in the Lakewood area of Cleveland? It sounded like the, all your other properties were in the, the Cleveland Heights area. Yeah, yeah. This is our first one in Lakewood. So it's about 25 minutes from Cleveland Heights to Lakewood. So our property managers, you know, going to be split between these two properties um, or these two areas, but they're the two best areas in, in Cleveland. So we don't mind. Let's see here. So, you know, I, I joke, I know these units have, have been remodeled since the 1960s. You can tell, you know, they have tile and some um, hard surface countertops and there's about 15 layers of paint on the, on the cabinets. Um, you have some shower inserts and different things, but a lot, of, a lot of it is original and the wood floors are very, um, in very good shape, but desperately need to be refinished. Um, and see we're going and actually our, our interior decorator told us we're keeping the pink on some of the bathrooms but um adding black appliances and and bronze and apparently it's in i'm excited to see what she does but um i'm taking her word for it because i don't love the pink so um so the first year we will have the uh seven percent preferred return however we probably won't actually pay out any cash flow for at least six months because the average rents are 700. We need to remodel all of the units. So we're going to um, move a ton of those renters into our remodeled units if they wanna go, or they'll just move out and remodel the units. And um, so we'll have some massive vacancy the first year and very, very low cash flow. However, um, the preferred return, that's the beautiful thing about a preferred return is if we say it starts accruing in month six, which on this one it will, um, 
then we have to pay you the 7% preferred return eventually. So we, what we feel as the numbers are telling us on this property is we'll probably start cash flowing in the one to 3% range the first year after month six, seven, or eight, just depending on how fast we can move on the remodels. But your 7% will start accruing. Year two will be in the 7% range. Year three and four will be above that. And by year five, the cash flow is going to be just a little bit ri ridiculous. Um, these are averages. And so if you look at the actual cash on cash by year three, should be at 10, year four, uh, about 12. So these are averages out over four years. But we should get you caught up on that preferred return at least by year four. And then either a sale or a cash out refi in year five. So average annual return 20 to 21%, um, huge amount of upside. And uh, we're really excited about this, about this property. Um, that's all I've got. Any questions? Hi, Sam. Uh, this is Sonal. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just wanted to know, um, what are the risks with syndication? Like you told us about all the upside. What's the downside if there is? Yeah, so, you know, taking us back to 2008, there's a few ways people got into trouble. Um, number one is bad operators. And that's currently happening now. That's why that guy I know is losing his property to the bank. They spent all their money and they only finished half the rehab and half the units are just vacant, unrehab, unremodeled. Um, so bad operators are the number one reason um, these deals don't go well. And so we're very, we run a very tight ship and um, we're not okay with, with uh, people not getting their work done and, and we're very careful with our budgets because of that. And that's why we, we buy less deals than most. Um, if it's too tight, we just we don't want to be in a position to have to have everything run perfectly to do well. We'd rather have wiggle room always. And so, you know, the risk is maybe you're investing with or looking at a deal with someone who isn't as conservative as, as us. The numbers are tighter. There's not wiggle room. Maybe they don't keep their eye on the ball and all of a sudden they're in trouble. They're out of money. They have a bunch of units that look like the one on the left that it's half remodeled and they can't rent it out. And so they lose it to the bank or they have to, um, probably, usually what happens is they ask you for more money. So all of a sudden, if you're planning on a 20% return on your money, they say, hey, if you invest at 100,000, we need another 100,000. Now you're getting like a 10% return on your money or less. And that, that happens all the time. We know it just happened to a, another operator in, in Louisiana. Um, they did it. They asked for $2 million uh, a year after closing because they ran out of money. So um, bad operators is number one. Um, number two is if a recession does come, we may have to just sit on this property for a while. Uh, if, if a recession comes, uh, values are going to go down and we may not be able to sell or refi and we'll just have to sit there and hold the property and, and um, wait until values come back up. That's the the risk in all of real estate is, is a recession. And so that's the reason you don't buy for appreciation. And that's a very, very important point to it that we'd want to um, have you guys understand is actually is a funny story. I just got off the phone with a guy last week. He's pretty upset with me. He's sending me all these deals and he's like, but it's going to appreciate. We should buy it. And, and I told him, I said, Hey, there's, there's no cash flow. So if a recession comes, I've got to come up with a couple hundred thousand dollars a year to pay the mortgage. And that makes me feel very uneasy. I, I don't want to buy just for appreciation. I want to know that it's going to cash flow in, in, through any economy. And so um, that's a big risk. If, you, if you're buying just for appreciation, you, that's where people got caught in 2008. They couldn't refi, they couldn't sell. All of a sudden their loan came due and it was worth way less and they had no cash flow and there was nothing they could do. The, the bank just had to take it. Um, and so you want to, again, this is why Steve, Brett, and I had this little bromance the last few years. We just, we're, they're the, we're the most conservative people we know, and we love it. You know, we just talk about uh, not being foolish and, and, um, and being conservative. And Jason Perro and his wife and I, that's why we connected really well um, early on, is they're extremely conservative with their money. And our friend, uh, Michael Young, Grace, he says it, in a funny way, he says, Hey, I'm a coward with my money. And, you know, Warren Buffett, his number one rule is never, ever lose money. So if there's potential 
of something happening and us losing capital, we don't buy that deal. And it's very simple. And, and ultimately, that's why this group out of Dallas committed $100 million to us recently, is they said, we like your deals. They're conservative. We can never have the risk of losing money. We can make less money than potentially we want. We can have it, something go wrong. Stuff always goes wrong, but we never want the risk of actually losing our money. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any things questions? going wrong, um, you know, ideally, if we invest, we hold out for the five years and then the property sells and we get our money back. Let's say two years in, I need to get out of the partnership. You know, what's the process there as a limited partner to, or limited investor to exit the opportunity? Yeah, How does I mean, that work? It shouldn't be too hard, um, you know, because you've actually taken a lot of the risk by investing through the, the remodel phase. And by in two years in, you know, we'll probably be mostly done with the remodel and it's going to be cash flowing very well. And, and if we're not in a recession or some type of weird environment, um, like wars in Ukraine or something, you know, it should be pretty easy to sell your investment. And so you would come to me and say, Sam, I want to sell my investment. How much is it worth? And we'd have to try and figure out what you're happy to take home um, and what an investor will pay you for your uh, portion, for your, for your percentage of that deal at that time. And we're, we, we don't care, we're happy to help you do that anytime. We haven't had it happen yet, um, but um, we're happy to do that. But if we're in a recession, you know, it may be a, quite a bit tougher to find that buyer or find a buyer at the price you want. But structurally it would just simply be that you'd assist in finding another re investor to replace me and, yep. and we, we'd get a, a valuation for that percentage ownership and then find someone who is interested in paying that. Exactly, yep. Good question. Uh, quick question on on terms of uh, when the property is sold. Let's say we invested fifty thousand. Uh, the money doubles as planned. It's sold for a hundred thousand. We already got thirty thousand depreciation the year one. Now we are liable for the eighty thousand which we gained, right? In terms Correct. Of yep. Yeah. So you're going to have some gains, and that's why we immediately buy another property and generate yeah, new tax losses. Well. Yeah. Um, and if we can, as a group, we'd love to 1031. It's very intricate, very difficult to take all of us and 1031 yeah, yeah, yeah. into a new property. It is possible, but um, most likely the, the answer, the best answer is we sell, you have a large capital gains liability. So we immediately reinvest as much as we can in another deal and generate those new losses to offset the gains that you had from that year. And why do you like Cleveland uh, other than the hospital? Because if I remember correctly, in 2008, Cleveland properties were like worth nothing. Yeah, I mean, much like a lot of the country, you had some investors that went in there and were very, very foolish. And if you talk to the big brokers that really know the market that have been there a long time, um, you know, back in 2005, six, seven, you could buy a property in East Cleveland and times were good, and and a lot of out-of-state investors were buying in neighborhoods that it didn't really matter until the, the recession hit, and values went to basically zero in, in those neighborhoods. Um, if you talk to the owners in these type of neighborhoods in good markets, they did fine in 2008. The Cleveland Clinic didn't slow down. People went back to school. More people went to med school. Um, but yeah, there was, um, and, and it, that's across the country. I mean, Las Vegas. Uh, Phoenix. Phoenix is an amazing market now, but I mean, people were buying in neighborhoods and locations that income-wise did not support the investment. So we look at average income a ton. We were just pitched a deal in Atlanta that the average income was like 28000 a year. And I'm like, how are they going to afford to pay 1200 a month? That's like half of their yearly income, you know? So uh, there, there's things that we look at. And, and so if you look back at 2008, people purchased and did zero research and purchased in terrible areas with really low income, no ability to back the rents that they were trying to get. And when the bottom fell out, there was, there was no way to save them. There was, you know, if, if you look at someone making, unfortunately making in the twenties and thirty thousands a year, a lot of those demographics don't have the best credit and they don't mind skipping town on a lease. And um, that's what happened. They would skip out on a lease and um, 
there's nothing you can do at that point. Whereas doctors and surgeons and med students, they do care about their credit. And um, that's why we don't buy D-class properties in poor neighborhoods. That's why we don't buy in the ghetto and the war zones where there's tons of upside, tons of potential in those locations. There's people doing it. We will never buy in those locations because of the renter demographic and what happened in 2008. So um, I would say every market struggled in 2008, especially the ghettos, especially the, the areas like that in every market across the country. Cleveland did struggle for sure. Um, but I would say it was is a lot of just the same thing that you saw in 2008, poor investments and um, poor decisions. I sent one question to Stephen here. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't quite understand if I, why like, uh, you have to sell like after five years. Yeah, what's the magic number five years? And is this the properties, rental property exactly have good income? Why not hold longer? Or it's just like, how does the model work here? Yeah, good question. Um, our goal is to double your money as fast as possible, Stephen. And, you know, the law of diminishing returns tells us we don't want to hold your equity that you've earned in the property because it's not earning you anything at that point. It's not earning you more money. So we want to pull that money out of the property as soon as we possibly can and have you put it towards another property. So that money is now earning you new equity on a new property, new cash flow, new tax deductions on a new property. So the, the five-year thing is because that's what a lot of the mortgages are right now. We actually have a lot of seven-year mortgages and 10-year mortgages right now on our properties. Um, we start looking at resale in year two or refinance. And so we're at that point with a lot of our properties. It's just a number. Um, the real answer to your question, Stephen, is as soon as the net operating income is high enough, which would support a cash out refi or a sale, that's what we're looking at. And we'll, we'll do that for you guys as soon as we can so that you can compound your investment portfolio and grow it as fast as possible. So what is happening on the cash out refi? For example, you know, you get like 6 million for that property. Let's say on year three or four or five, you own only like 3 million on the property because, you know, great rent, great returns. So you refinance, get another 3 million. Are we getting 50% of the money back and still remain the same percentage owners of the good, property? Or Good question. Happen? Yeah. Yeah. That's a nice way that we structure our deals is we don't reduce your percentage ownership when we do a cash out refi. Your cash flow calculation does change because we can't give you calculate a uh, cash flow on money that's not in the deal. So if you were making $1,000 a month, before the cash out refi and we gave you half of your money back, now you're going to be making half of that, you know, like 500 a month. Um, but also you've got half of your money back and your percentage ownership in the deal is still the same. So if the property goes up in value another $1,000, you're still getting that $1,000 equity bump or increase. Um, but the cash flow amount does change because the cash flow calculated or is calculated based on the money left in the deal or your investment in the deal. But it's still basically the same percentage because it's mm -hmm. the total is. So let's say if it's, you hold the end on, of holding the property, yeah, it's let's based say on money in years. the deal. So let's say you held the property for some reason for 10 years and you're able to do two times 50% cash out. We're getting all our money back, but we're still part owners, uh, same part ownership. Yep. And so, well, okay, that's a good question. Let's say we do a 100% cash out refi. There's no longer a preferred return. It's just a straight split at that point um, because you don't have any money left in the deal. It's, that's an infinite return. And actually, um, Grace, you're in Albuquerque, right? Yeah, we're going to do that with Albuquerque this year. So we're going to do a refinance in October where Grace is getting all of her money back. And so she's no longer getting a preferred return um, in the documents. And it, it says, you know, if, if Grace hits a certain return, the split between the general partners and the limited partners is, and I can't remember on that deal, but let's just say 50-50. So at that point, now she's not getting it based on a preferred return or any other number. She's getting her percentage of 50% of the income. So if she's a 2% owner, then she's getting 2% of 50% of the income at that point because all of her money has been returned to her. And that's how that's calculated. So it um, gets pretty, 
um, intricate. There's a lot of ways we can do it. Um, I would say for everyone else's um, sake um, that we can probably get pretty deep. So feel free to schedule a call with me and we can get into it and give you a few examples. But that's yeah. basically how it is. So Sam, so who, would, who would have the ownership of the building at that point? What does, would Grace ownership still have change. equity? Yeah, ownership nope. does not change. So okay, when you're talking about a cash out, you're just talking about the initial investment amounts. Okay. Yes, your money is back to you. So your risk is gone and you're, you can redeploy that capital, which is amazing. And I'm going to um, call Grace and tell her congrats when we do that in October. Um, but her percentage ownership isn't going to change in the building. So if the building goes up by a million dollars, Grace still gets to benefit from that, that increase. Okay, got it. You're keeping that property? I think I it's a definite return. You're keeping it, right? Uh, we're keeping it. They, they convinced me to keep it. That's the one that we had dumpster divers and the property <laughs> next door is a slum lord. but we're doing so well. We initially thought we'd get 700, 750 a month in rent at post remodel and we're getting 899 now. So, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I have, that's what Michael Young, our friend says, you know, like you, you never sell it because you get your, all your money back and it's making an income for you. Why would you ever sell it? If, maybe that's why you don't want to sell it at that point. You know, yeah, unless yeah. someone pays you a really good price, but you have to look at it, right? Yeah, the only reason we're going to sell is if we can't cash out most or all of the money mm -hmm. because, because of maybe the lending situation or interest rates. So we don't want to just let your money sit in a deal and, and not earn you more money. And so at that point, we would sell. But yeah, it's I, I, didn't want, I wanted to sell this property to upgrade to something bigger, but um, and in a better location without dumpster divers um but it's it's a cash cow it's it's an absolute pig and we're not going to sell it i think connie has a question connie do you have a question yeah i have a question when you do sell and you roll over you're saying you roll over do we then at that point get to pick the property or does it automatically roll over the next property that you guys gonna be yeah you always get to choose what you do with your money okay that's a good question Thank you. Yeah. Is there a time? Well, I guess you return or you return the money or you just let it sit and then deploy it again? Or how does that work? We have to return it. That's a good question. So like Steve, um, he brought about $3 million into the El Paso deal that we closed in October. He sold his uh, a Phoenix asset and like half of his investors put money in one of his Atlanta deals and half of them decided to put money in, in El Paso. And so you know, he returned their capital and then they just sent it right back to him a, a month later. So I, I, I know Sam for a long time, but I also, you know, check his numbers. So I invite, you know, you guys to look at other people's syndication uh, offering memorandum and see how much they allocate for vacancy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they're doing 30%, 20%. You know, some other people may be doing 3 to 5%. That might be very risky. You know, so, so I challenge him all the time on his numbers. And then I also like the fact that I can pick up the phone and call him, you know, if I have to. So, but I, um, and then uh, recently in the Bay Area, I think in Fremont, one guy has a syndication. Do you remember his name, uh, Sam? Like he says, a syndication of um, land and then it didn't work out. And then it, oh. it was in the news. I think so, I sent the um, link to you, yeah. Oh, I don't remember his name, but um, Jeremy, our good friend who you're, um, at Remax that we both know. Um, he is in a land deal, two syndications right now that still aren't off the ground and it's been four years. So he's received zero return in four years. And I don't think that's the same one, Grace. I'm not sure. I'm not no, going to name I, his name. I, I can look it up. Known. It's just, it's in the news about six months ago and then it's in Fremont. So mm -hmm. like, you know, the operator are also salespeople, right? So you, you that's why you have to educate yourself on how to read the numbers and how to tell yeah. which one is better than others. So I, I'll find that article if I can, I'll send it yeah. to you. And, and Grace, that's a really good point. I mean, there's things that I can do to a pro forma to make it look really sexy. And you guys wouldn't know because it's on the back end in the underwriting, but um, you know, I can adjust the exit cap rate and say, okay, well, the market's gonna stay crazy hot despite increased uh, interest rates and inflation. And dishonestly, I can say we're probably going to sell this San Antonio property for 90 million when maybe it's probably only going to sell for 80. Those are just round numbers I'm throwing out. Um, 
like you brought up vacancy, you know, oh, we're going to operate it so well that we'll have only 2% vacancy when in realistic, you know, uh, in, in real life, you're going to average five to 7% vacancy. So, um, yeah, those are, that's a good point, Grace. There's a bunch of things that people do to try to make their deals look better because they really want your money. And we're kind of the opposite. We have plenty of money and we don't want to buy a deal that, um, doesn't perform like we said it would. I had three questions. Did you want them all at once or? So one by one. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. So the first question is, um, I'm not sure. I'm very new to this. Um, Ms. Sang, you know, extended the invite to us. So we chimed in. Um, but when you're talking about selling the property and at that point we can pick it and choose uh, what the next investment would be. If we're, if we, let's say we own 10% of the property that was just sold, mm -hmm. just making sure that the next property, the money that we, that you are now reinvesting would obviously be proportionate to how much the property is worth. Is that correct? Yeah. So it, it may be a completely different percentage. Maybe you put a hundred thousand in, in the Albuquerque property and, and that would have been like, probably close to 10%. Um, you put a hundred thousand into this property for 68 million, that's like 0.8% or 0.6%. So totally depends on um, each deal is very, very different. We're going to give you all of your money back. You can decide how much to reinvest with us and all the numbers start new and start fresh and, and you'll have all new tax write-offs, all new investments, all new cash flow, and each deal is its own. Okay. And then for my second, third question, um, one is on, a, on, on average, how often do you guys buy properties? And in addition to that, because um, all we have is just one investment property. Uh, we bought that last year, again, with the help of Ms. Sang. Uh, so this is syndication is a whole new ball game. So I guess what would be the advice uh, for, for people to gain? Yeah, um, you know, really good question. So I, I started my podcast in 2020, I guess, right when COVID started. It's called Recession Proof Real Estate Investing. And one of the questions I ask the investors is, you know, what if you could go back and I interview a lot of really successful people, if you could go back, what would you change? And their answer was a resounding, I wish I had never done small deals. I wish I'd only done big deals because when things go wrong, you have the scale of, you know, in this case, 340 renters um, to help weather any storm. And so through my podcast, that's one thing I learned. And um, so my advice would be, Grace is really good. She's really good at finding good deals and, and good properties. I've owned single family. Um, I prefer only to go multifamily. And honestly, at this point, I prefer deals over 150 doors. They, they run so much more smooth and honestly over 250 doors, even more smooth. And, and that's really for a few reasons, it's scale, but it's also, you can hire more good people. You can hire a bunch of good people to work on the property. You can have a really nice leasing office. You can have a better community and it just runs better. Um, we do just have one qualification to invest with us. I should have brought this up at the beginning. You have to be an accredited investor, which means if you're married, you make 300,000 a year. If you're single and you have done so for the last two years, if you're single, you've made 200,000 a year for the last two years, or you're worth over a million dollars, not including your personal home. And so the SEC regulates us really hard. Um, we are highly, highly regulated industry or um, market, you know, portion of the industry, real estate industry. So everything I do is through an SEC attorney. All of our filings are through the SEC. Um, all of the investments, you know, we could be audited at any moment by the SEC. And so um, that's a hard rule. You have to be accredited. And um, also what's nice is if you guys do have legal questions about these deals, my SEC attorney that I pay, I don't know how many thousands a year, a lot, is open to you guys for questions. So Mauricio is my guy that we use on all of our deals. If you guys have questions, you can um, give him a call or let me know and, and I'll give you his contact info. Um, but he works for guys that have, you know, billion dollar portfolios. He sees lots of different deals and um, he likes us because we're conservative. We're not billion yet, but um, 
uh, he's got some good things to say about us, and he can tell you what to look which, for as well. Sandwich law firm is he with? He's his own um, his own group. So syndication attorneys are kind of their own class of of attorney um, or SEC attorneys, I should say. So um, just change his name. It's Mauricio Raul. Terry is an attorney, so that's why. Okay. <laughs> I'll send you the, all the, uh, we can pass on that information. Here's a funny story why I like him. I was at this mastermind event in Denver and he was presenting to us and he, and there's always gray areas and I, I always try to stay away from the gray areas. So I knew what those were, but he presented them in a way that said, you can't do this. You can only do this. You can't do that. And I looked around the room and, and he said, and he said, have any of you guys been doing your deals this way? And and I saw people's faces go white and realize they've been breaking the law. And at any moment, the SEC could send them to jail. I don't look good in stripes. I don't want to go to jail. So I'm, I'm a hard no on, on doing anything like that. But he's, he's the ultra conservative attorney, kind of matches our style and um, makes sure that we're doing things on the conservative side, not touching that gray area. Samuel, this is uh, Michael. Uh, thank you, Grace, for inviting us to tonight to this event. Um, I'm curious as to what what's your typical frequency of the number of deals that you do per, oh, per yeah. year? So this is the, like the first time we're hearing about it. It sounds like one is the San Antonio is already closing mm -hmm. and the other one is it's halfway there. So like what's, what's your typical number of deals that you do do per year? Yeah, sorry. I think um, who asked that question? Harry asked that question. Sorry, Harry. Um, so we did three deals last year. We did um, we did just over fifty million in acquisitions, but that was only three deals. We will have three deals closed this year by June, and probably do another five or six. I mean, getting the hundred million dollar investment kind of boosted our purchasing power quite a bit. Um, so uh, we're hoping to do three hundred million in acquisitions this year in in twenty twenty two. But uh, right now, we'll we'll have our first three done by June. And then to, to piggyback off on that question again for the first timers, on average, how much are people normally putting in, and what would would you like foresee as far as like the minimum? Um, Good not question. Not too much personal information, but just had a kid, so. Yeah. <laughs> so we got to be a little, well, little careful with the money. So congrats on the kids and, and congrats on still investing. Um, most people won't make the sacrifices to invest. So good job. Um, 50,000 is our minimum investment. Um, I think on San Antonio, it's 100,000. Um, that one's done pretty much raised. There, there might be like 100 or 200,000 left on San Antonio. Mm -hmm. I'd have to look at the numbers tomorrow. Um, Cleveland, uh, we're releasing tomorrow evening, I believe. So I'll be sending out an email, um, opening that up to investors. It's about half spoken for, but until you sign a paper and you're accredited and you wire me your money, um, I don't save your spot. Um, so it's first come first serve and we're raising two and a half million for that. And then Cleveland um, number five will be coming up. We'll raise another, I wanna say four and a half, five million, five and a half million for that. I can't remember. Um, but there, there's plenty of room coming up for you guys in the next two months. The accreditation uh, takes a couple of days. There's mm -hmm. an application, a third party website. So it does take a couple of days. So you can, yeah. and it's good for three years, right? Five years now. Yeah, they just changed it from three to five. Yeah, so five years and you don't have to get accredited again. Basically, we won't go through the hassle of verifying that you're accredited. We don't want to believe your CPA either and put that on their shoulders. So via your CPA and this third party, um, they send us a letter that says that you're an accredited investor and we'll, it's like 60 bucks, I think, mm -hmm. um, but we can send you the link to do that. And, um, but yeah, good questions, everyone. Anything else? Uh, so Sam, uh, would you also be sending us um, updates uh, periodically of the new property or the new deals that you would be um, making or in the horizon or something so that we have rough idea, like what's coming up, where, how much to invest and all that stuff. Yeah, it's yes, but that's hard <laughs> because we're always writing offers every week and these crazy people keep outbidding us. 
and uh, it's hard to get a property under contract. So yes, absolutely. As soon as we think we've got a deal or as soon as we, we've got a deal under contract, we'll let you know, hey, we're not ready to accept money yet, but in the next two to three weeks, here's this deal that we're going to have. So it's kind of a, it moves really fast because we don't want to tell you about it and answer all these questions on a property that we end up getting outbid on. Um, but yes, we, we always send out emails and we send out little teasers as soon as we get something under contract. And so we can add you to that list. So Sam seems like uh, we take a couple of days for the verifies the credit like investors. So the San Antonio deal is not really, it's out of the questions, right? Yeah, you, you're closing in uh, two days, right? We're cl- no, we're closing on the 7th. Oh, okay, 7th. Yeah, yeah. So, so if there's room, um, I'm not sharing my screen, right? Let me go. Let me just look really quick, see how much money that has hit our bank account or the title company account, I guess. And I'll tell you if there's any room. Okay. Timber Hills. Oh, you know what? That's why. Let's see here. Let me put that auto sum. Hmm. So we will be about 125,000 oversubscribed as of tomorrow. But um, I, th- I think there's a few people that my other partner is, he's saving space for a few of his people. So if you guys are looking to get into this deal, just let me know, um, because I know he's saving space for a few of his his investors. And I know we'd rather just go ahead and fill it than save space. They can get on the next deal if they're dragging their feet. Um, So we're pretty much done with San Antonio. But if you do want to squeak in, let me know. And we'll see if we can give some people the boot if you're willing to move fast. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Sam. Thank you very much, Ms. Grace. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I'll send Sam's contact to everybody. So if you have uh, further questions, you can call him. And... You know what? I'll, I'll type it right now in the chat. How about that? Now, um, I'm pretty inundated with emails right now. So I just typed my email, but I'm just going to tell you guys, um, text me if you want to talk, and I'll, I'll set up a time for us to talk. So I'm going to type my email or my cell phone number as well. I'm a single dad with two kids 50% of the time. And so, you know, um, I get behind sometimes on email. I do, I will admit. (laughs) Um, But if you text me, I'll absolutely set up a time to go over things with you, answer any questions you have. And um, would love to talk to any of you. Grace, thank you so much. Um, Glad you're doing well, by the way. My name on Facebook too, because then you see a lot of his posts regarding like the projects and what the topics they talked about. So yep, you'll see a bunch of my kids and, and then real estate. That's all you'll see is on Facebook. Maybe you a fish or two. Too. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think it's popped up yet, Sam. Did you yeah. respond to everybody? Uh, um, yeah, it's in the chat. We don't we don't see see oh, I did it directly to, hold yeah. on, hold on. I'm, I'm <laughs> ridiculous. Everyone in meeting. There you go. Yep. Okay, guys. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Sam, for your time. Yep. Thank you, guys. Have a good evening. Thank you, all.